largest fintech fest, the Global Fintech Fest 2021. This event is organized by Fintech Convergence Council and Payment Council of India of the Internet and Mobile Association of India. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to the today's panel discussion on the topic, role of fintech in building a better post-pandemic UK-India perspective. Joining me on stage is Mr. Zubin Tafti, Director of Payments Transformation at PwC India. We are joined by Ms. Rashmi Shatpute, India Country Manager Vice. We are joined on stage by Mr. Gurjot Pal Singh, Chief Executive Officer, Tide India. We are also joined by Mr. Suhil Samir, Chief Executive Officer, Officer Bharat Pay. We are also joined by Mr. Vaibhav Joshi, Chief Digital Officer, Equitas Small Finance Bank. He'll be joining us later on the stage. So without wasting much time, let me hand over the stage to you, Mr. Tafti. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, hi, good afternoon to everyone and to all the other all the other listeners out there. Uh, just to get started, maybe I think let's get to know each of us a little bit better. So I think we'll spend maybe 30, 60 seconds for introducing and uh, then we'll get straight away into the into the meat of the topic. Uh, so I'll start with myself, uh, Zupin Tafti, a director of payments transformation pla practice in PwC. Been 15 odd years of experience. 90% of that has been in the world of payments. Predominantly, we are a very uh, focused team that uh, focuses in payments consulting. We cover the entire value chain, right from you know strategy right down to operations, processes, and you know regulations or technology for that matter. Uh, my mandate per se in PwC is to drive uh, all sales and business development activities with two broad segments. So one is, of course, all the non-banking clients in the country. So the fintechs, the tech payment processors, the large big techs and things like that that deal in payments. And the other one is uh, we as a competency or a COE in the PwC network, you know, a large team of 50 odd members. So we get pulled into a lot of projects across across the network, as we call it in PwC. And I do a lot of work in regional areas, more predominantly the Southeast Asia, the Middle East and the Africa are the kind of the areas that we do a lot of work. So that's a short, uh, short introduction about myself. Uh, going on to the panelists, uh, ladies first, Rashmi, over to you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rashmi. I lead uh, WISE for India and South Asia market. Uh, WISE was formerly known as TransferWISE. We are a UK headquartered fintech and we are focused on making cross-border payments much more seamless, cost-effective and instant across the globe. Uh, prior to WISE, I have been working in the payments ecosystem for almost a decade now in digital as well as cross-border payments. Um, very glad to be here. Gurujit Pal, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Zubin. Um, hi, all. Uh, very glad to be here. And, uh, um, you know, thanks to the organizers for having us, but uh, for organizing this amazing, uh, you know, event over the three days. Uh, I, I was uh, listening to a number of discussions. So, uh, you know, I think uh, amazing effort. Uh, I think the um, Tide, which is a SME focused neo bank in India market. Uh, and, you know, just, just, uh, mm, for the listeners' benefit, we are the leading SME-focused challenger bank in in the UK, uh, and uh, we have uh, you know more than six percent market share uh, within SMEs in the in the UK market, and uh, we are bringing our uh, uh, product to India. Along with that, we have a large development center uh, based out of Hyderabad in India, and uh, we also have another development center in Bulgaria. Uh, so that's us as an organization. I personally come with uh, uh, more than a decade of experience in uh, in fintech, have been part of uh, uh, early uh, stage uh, teams in Bank Bazaar and then in Payu, where I, I spent close to seven and a half years uh, prior to my uh, role with Tide. So look look forward to the discussion today. Thanks. Thanks, Guru Pal. Over to you, Suhel. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, glad to be here. I think it's uh, been a wonderful session. I did manage to catch a couple of uh, other panels. Um, I run Bharat Pay. We are uh, India's largest offline payment processors on UPI. Uh, we roughly sort of do $12 billion of transaction annually on our platform. And on the back of that, uh, happen to be sort of the largest lender uh, to small shopkeepers, right? So... Um, and um, and I think as we sort of go on to build the business, uh, we are 
we continue to be sort of heavily merchant focused, but are introducing new products on the consumer side, especially around sort of buy now, pay later, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So, um, I'm new to payments. Uh, I'm new to lending. Uh, my background is consumer. I used to lead consumer brands. Uh, happened to lead uh, launch couple of consumer brands uh, which may have come across Saregama, Karva, Tuyam. They were sort of uh, some of my earlier launches and before that spent um, a bunch of time in McKinsey leading the consumer practice for Asia. Thanks, Sorel. Over to you, Vaibhav. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Vaibhav Joshi, this side. Uh, I'm the Chief Digital Officer with Equita Small Finance Bank. So as a part of my mandate, I lead uh, the neo banking uh, uh, fintech uh, uh, vertical for the bank. I lead the digital transformation for the bank. I lead the digital payments for the bank. I lead the digital transaction backing for the bank. I lead the digital channels for the bank. I lead the digital strategy for the bank. And I also lead the digital banking sales for the bank. In addition to digital liabilities, digital assets, digital corporate, digital MSME, digital government, so on and so forth. So digital banking at Equitas is actually a, a separate p &L on its own. I have uh, two decades worth of experience uh, uh, before Equitas. I was with Yes for six years, uh, started the digital banking team over there. And before that, I've done three startups of my own, one in food, one in payments, and one in technology. So nice to be here with you all. Thanks. Thanks Vibhav, for that. So I said, uh, so hey, fellow audience, I think we have a pretty action-packed panel. We've got business banking covered in Tide. We've got cross-border payments covered in... Uh, wise with Rashmi, we've got you know an upcoming, upgrowing you know domestic startup uh, Bharatpay who does stuff on the payment side and the lending side, and of course we have a very much small finance bank, very much digitally focused the CDO which is in Vibhav. So I think we have a very good panel, a good combination. I'm excited to go ahead with our conversation and hoping to get nice uh, varied views. So I think the first question I have is a more of an initial primer and more open to most people. And I'll give everybody a chance to talk about starting with Rashmi. But, uh, you know, assuming the pandemic and let's hope the pandemic is behind us. Uh, of course, it has given tailwinds to this whole digital and you know digital adoption. And I see that completely. But other than that, you know, what are those? Uh, I mean, economies did go down. They've started recovering. We see the recovery phase happening. So what does it mean for fintechs? Are there any emerging trends? Maybe it be in the UK or the India, uh, depending on you know where all each of you all play. Would like to hear any specific trends that you observed uh, and anything that's unique to a country that you believe may not be unique to others. So just happy to hear that from the audience. Uh, Rashmi, starting with you. Hey, thanks, Zubin. Um, a quick one, right? Um, so yes, like you said, uh, the pandemic is an event that has accelerated digital adoption across segments, right? Whether fintech, whether other consumer segments as well. Um, the interesting bit is, I think more and more, the newer customer segments that were probably a little iffy about uh, being on digital modes earlier um, have now shifted to digital modes. And the interesting bit is that they continue to stay with these modes as well, right? I think there's a report that has come out that at least nine out of 10 people who have recently shifted to digital modes, whether in consumer segments or fintechs, plan to stay on board. Um, what does that mean for fintechs or, you know, technology companies at large is, um, I think we are going to see a continued investment. And this is, you know, across countries, right, in at least three different pillars. One is trust. How well can you build trust in the consumer to transact on that particular platform, especially in fintechs where you're handing the customers money? I think trust becomes a key thing, right? The second bit is, of course, consumer experience. Um, and consumer experience could mean even, um, you know, instant gratification. So, for example, can you make cross-border payments more instant? Um, and the third bit should be uh, uh, what we see is how can you make customer journeys more intuitive and seamless, right? So I think across these three pillars, we're going to continue to see a lot of different innovations and investments across fintechs. And that's how we see it. Oh, thanks, Rashmi. Rajit Pal from your side. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, as as Rashmi mentioned about adoption, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So that's that's been the phenomena everywhere. But along with that, uh, you know, what the pandemic has changed uh, for us, specifically from a semi neo banking standpoint, uh, is that uh, you know, uh, see, the the uh, neo banking. Um, uh, in UK is pretty advanced, right? And as we were launching into India, we had a view that this is how India would progress towards, uh, uh, you know, reaching that stage. 
but now uh, you know what the pandemic has done is the the push on the enablement side uh, right would reduce the time uh, which we would take to become a advanced uh, you know neo banking ecosystem as such uh this is the push but, you know there have been a lot of enabling things which have happened from the regulator and government side uh but along with that you know there is a lot of traction in the fintech ecosystem itself right uh so for example when uh, we were starting out in in payu in 2013 right uh so we were making a a layer to integrate all the payment options right and any merchant who had to integrate would just come uh, to us and you know he would have all the options enabled on on the in the similar way right the banks have so many digital products to offer and if as a neo bank or as a platform provider you uh, had to integrate it, there was a, a a time to it but with a number of fintech players coming in between uh, building out a lot of enabling rails i think that's that's a new phenomenon and that actually takes the ecosystem to to the next level uh, that's that's uh, about india specifically on the uk side uh, you know of course a uh, lot of uh, push on digitization but uh, what we saw was that a lot of new smes uh, you know uh, registered during this time and since there was a digital way to do that uh, you know the number of businesses which uh, which were born or which uh became organized uh you know during this period were a lot larger than what was happening before that and the trend continues so that's that's a amazing thing that we we have seen thanks thanks for rajit pal uh so hello what you yeah so um i think uh, one sort of uber theme or couple of uber themes and a couple of places where india is different uh, i think as rashmi said digital has become mainstream i think there is no going back everyone has got comfortable with the thought of using it and everybody has sort of realized that it's actually quite seamless right i think covid taught us that the uh, easiest way to do a cashless transaction touchless transaction is actually upi because you're only touching your own phone and nothing else i think uh, that sort of set to remain i think now it is up to the industry to sort of uh, not break that trust i will say the other way around right so i think uh, what we do on sort of uh, ensuring frauds don't happen what we do on sort of ensuring that this remains seamless what we do on cx will will basically determine how many of the users sort of fall back to the old ways of using cash or sort of uh, other modes of payments right so i think that sort of uh, true probably sort of everywhere i think the second thing which is which the pandemic has done um, it is made actually from a conventional bank point of view underwriting very very difficult for a loan right uh, people have gone through huge swings of income people have lost their jobs uh, like a guy who was sort of lendable um, 18 months back is no longer lendable right so or at least how a bank will sort of evaluate i think that will sort of create huge space for companies like us who look at alternate data for companies like uh, uh, like neo banks which sort of have access to other ways of underwriting uh, and therefore i think there will be a um, i think the convergence of sort of this neo bank fintech bank sort of co-working and uh, and sort of serving different segments of the customers and helping consumers win back sort of their credit scores and rating and getting them up and running i think that's sort of a second thing which i uh, foresee happening quite a lot right like just to give you context like a typical bank will take 3 months to figure out whether the pandemic is over or not right so uh, as payments will start coming back and sort of collections will start picking up but uh, but for someone like bharat pay which is in the cash flow and sees transactions on a daily basis it takes me 3 days of transaction volume to figure out that we are back right so i think uh, ability to sort of uh, and i think that that's a great space for me but it's also a great space for sort of banks and sort of fintechs uh, and neo banks to sort of collaborate and build bigger i think one distinction which i um, always think uh, will happen and i believe india is sort of moving towards that uh, between us uk and sort of india is i think a lot of the world still tends to be heavy mdr dependent uh, market right so um, and and it sort of works well because the retail margins the shopkeeper margins are like 25 to 30% the guy doesn't sort of mind paying you a couple of percentage on that uh, uh, to accept payments right but but india where sort of cash was always mainstream 
if you tell a guy that I will give you your money into your bank account two days later and charge you 2% for that, I don't think that's going to fly ever, right? And and that's what sort of UPI did. Like uh, the day peer-to-peer UPI was always big, right? When it became big on merchants, the day government announced MDR is zero. Uh, card acceptance was always reasonable. Uh, it sort of um, the last 18 months or three years of growth on card has been on the back of rupee saying 0% transaction fees and sort of rupee gaining so much share. Um, Amex credit card used to be 5% MDR at one point of time or like now whatever 2.2% MDR. I think India will progressively move towards a zero MDR regime. I think therefore companies will have to innovate on how they make money, right? Uh, a lot of the new pay, uh, new banks in sort of uh, US would actually be no banks. They are just credit card issuers and uh, they make money on MDR and everything is done by the bank, right? I will not even call it a new bank. Uh, I don't think those type of models necessarily can exist in India for a very, very long time. I think people will have to uh, become closer to a conventional bank versus like, a let's say, a distribution arm. I think that's sort of where the two markets will differ significantly. But I think uh, my sort of uh, biggest learning of COVID has been sort of, uh, um, and we get a lot of um, kudos from everyone around us on how we've grown. But I think... 80% of the growth is just the market shifting, right? And I think it's now for ups to sort of live up to that uh, opportunity, which all of us have been provided. Thanks. Thanks. You made an interesting point about the lower fee of transactions and rather making money from them, right? And I think that's a fundamental shift. And I see that India has been one of the one, I think, leading that that charge because it is is a quite price sensitive market. Uh, Wipe over to you for some takes from a digital bank perspective. So, Zubin, I think pandemic has been a boon in disguise for fintechs. Uh, While the adoption of digital started post-demonetizing itself, but the sector has really seen, you know, boom since the consumer now has become more digital and less physical. Earlier, consumer was used to transacting physically or digitally. Today, what has happened is during pandemic, because, you know, you know, you not wanted to venture out of your homes and stuff. You had to rely on your mobile phone. So everything became digital. And the moment everything uh, became digital, you know, uh, uh, you know, fintechs came into foreplay because banks were not too much, uh, you know, more on the consumer uh, experience side. So, you know, apps which had good UI, UX, uh, which had good digital journeys, you know, but they became popular. Neo banking picked up, you know. Uh, so we see the success of Neo X, we see the success of Fi, Jupiter, Frio, Monitor. So on digital adoption, uh, we see the numbers, you know, uh, that NPCI is clocking month on month. You know, uh, personally talking about, you know, something like a small finance bank, uh, while, you know, RBI brought in moratoriums, loan moratoriums and stuff. But uh, collection efficiency, you know, did pick up when we brought in digital collections, especially, uh, you know, uh, where uh, in a SFB kind of a scenario where there is heavy reliance on physical collection and on the microfinance side we have people going door to door for doing the collections there when we introduce something like you know whatsapp banking when we introduce something like a url link based collections and so on and so forth and you know it was it worked like miracles the collection efficiency which was so down in phase you know uh, 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 the first last year it has actually picked up and it has picked up for uh, most of the banks if we talk about you know uh, uh, if we talk about adoption from you know target segment specific so if you talk about merchants as a base yes merchants have moved on to digital now and you know success of uh, uh, bharat pay clearly you know says that if you look about you know uh, on the lending side we are seeing gurjot pal and rashmi on this panel and you know we know that yes the market is extremely uh, you know uh, ripe for picking and there is a lot to be done on the digital lending side over there if you talk about you know msmes or smes or corporate then there is you know a diamond dozen opportunities over there because now everything is in revolving around you know how a neo banking solution or a fintech solution can be targeted so much so that you know entities are now offering a mini erp which clubs and in invoicing taxation payments lending uh, inventory ordering everything clubbed into a single app and bundle it and then segmentize it to a specific target you know so uh, I think pandemic has really opened a lot of horizons, which we were, you know, not looking at earlier, but now we have started looking at it and segment wise, industry wise, you know, uh, the talk TG has started picking it up. Zoom. So thanks. Thanks. Bye bye for that. Uh, I think next question is Suhel. We can get him on, get him on stage. 
so so well this question is more from a you know funding growth market visibility india side right i mean there are research studies that says <laughs> india is the fastest growing fastest growing fintech market it's the third largest uh, ecosystem and from i think funding we're also third behind maybe a us and a uk i think the numbers stay around 2 point out some billion dollars have come in in the first half of you know 2021 so i mean what are your key reasons why this sudden attractiveness we've seen you know fundings valuation unicorns coming up so much more regularly and often today than maybe a few years ago so what's really doing this demand in india because i think pandemic is something that's i think affected all but still i think india is really really boomed in this space so what are those reasons why and any particular area segments that you believe is benefiting the most from this yeah so i think uh, to be honest i don't think pandemic uh, was the only reason i think the ball was set rolling long before uh, literally from demonetization gst coming in and then obviously pandemic uh, led to the acceleration of all of this right and uh, uh, i think to be honest india is such a huge market uh, um, a lot of payment sort of driven innovations are actually uh, i think all credit to rbi and sort of npci uh, to get us onto the world map and say that india can really innovate and lead the world in sort of bringing new technology to market right and and that sort of has created a um, created a huge spiral effect on everything else right so payments uh, uh, like at least as a lender i always say that uh, uh, lending is sort of very easy if you want to distribute a few thousand crores of loans you can stand on the road and by the end of it it's all gone uh, but uh, but actually being able to figure out who to lend to and more importantly to be able to figure out how to collect that um, is sort of uh, is sort of lot more critical right and and um, and sort of the payment revolution which sort of um, uh, rbi and npci brought in has sort of allowed that right so uh, today i don't worry about the loans i give by and large because if the guy unless the guy wants to genuinely genuinely default money will come back on its own through the upi on sort of a daily basis right so so i think um, just the innovation which rbi and npci and a few other sort of bodies which are involved with this have shown and and sort of all the good work india has done sort of to clean up uh, the historical challenges um, has made sort of the a uh, space overall attractive i think there was never a question on whether there is a huge market opportunity or not right so uh, so many people and like uh, i i think the world bank report says 500 trillion uh, credit gap right it's not even like how much credit is out there it's credit gap right so if you have players playing in that um uh, there are bound to be and as soon as sort of there are ways to make payments happen and collections happen there was bound to be and as long as there is sort of a positive regulatory environment i think it was there was bound to be tons of investments right and and that sort of one um, leg of the business which is sort of growing and if you see everyone from us to cred to like uh, razor pay um, that sort of the story which is panning out uh, i think as the world becomes sort of more connected and more digital uh, a lot of the stuff which uh, like uh, rashmi is doing sort of becomes even more relevant for india right so um, historically remittances were like one off uh, i i don't even remember sort of ever using it as much today i do probably five a month uh, and sort of uh, the world sort of coming together has again uh, and indian diaspora sort of spreading across the world has sort of again made that mainstream right so i think um, the the market like when you have so many people uh, with the reasonable sort of uh, per capita incomes and uh, and this is only reported numbers what sort of uh, still there is a large part of the economy which is in cash uh, the market demand was sort of always a given i think what has really changed is the intent of the regulators to be more progressive and uh, and sort of allowing lots of experiments to flourish in parallel uh, and only start thinking about how to regulate how to manage when sort of some of those experiments become meaningful enough to now be a part of the economy right so i think that sort of a big shift for me and i at least um, and maybe i'm sort of biased but i don't see this uh, wave sort of going anywhere for the next 4 uh, 5 years at least so sure, thanks well so i think brought up some key points about i think a lot of digital government led infrastructure being built to be able to use 
you know, rails backing digitization of data i think is an important important thing that has you know made things possible and as you said i mean big gaps already demand is like it's there for the taking and i think uh, it's just that those solutions have to come in and you know enable enable it to be able to kind of grow so i i totally get that and i see that there therefore investments because there's a lot of promise for the future there's a lot of you know domestic demand that needs to be met and i think yeah that's one of the reasons that really is making this space very attractive uh, for investors uh, so let me move on to uh, vibhav from equitas so this is given that you're from the banking side you're doing a lot of initiatives internally on digital just wanted to wanted to understand that from a partnership side and you know we've seen a lot of fintechs work with banks uh, neo banks uh, uh, small finance banks so just wanted to know what are those different models in which you all you know co-opt and you know work in the market together any any specific faces uh, any specific areas or any specific models that you believe is working well for you all or do you believe the industry is uh, doing things differently sure Zubin. so let me uh, you know since you are asking me about engagement models let me come more from a you know a pure play banking perspective from a regulatory point of view and then i'll talk, talk about the practical models that work in the market okay so what happens is when <clears throat> when we engage with any fintech you know regulator only allows us to engage in a certain method and i am leaving the payments part aside because if we payments is something that has been simplified after mpci coming in you know it's <clears throat> basically integration and you don't need to really get onboarded in a certain manner but if we talk about everything other than payments uh, then you know there is a method through which we have to get onboarded so you can either get onboarded as a co brand partner Uh, with a bank, okay, wherein you know the bank can onboard you as a program manager or a co-brand partner. Second is you get onboarded as a business correspondent or a BC, and third is where you onboard onboarded as a TSP or a technology service provider. Okay, now this is essentially what regulator recognizes. So uh, you know. while uh, while the fintechs may say that you know we are distributing or you know uh, we are acquiring or you know uh, we are issuing so on and so forth at the end of the day at, at, at the back end this is what the regulator recognizes and when the regulator audits the bank the regulator actually looks at you know has there been an executive outsourcing committee approval has there been a compliance committee approval has there been a board approval so on and so forth and then you know what are the various audits that you are doing with this fintech you know what sort of an integration has been done so when an integration is done you know have you gone through the application security testing has the appsec been done and if the appsec has been done then you know what sort of encryption are you using you know are there any low points medium points or high points that are open okay so on and so forth so there is actually a very uh, very big governance matrix that goes on the other side on the banking side and whenever we partner with a fintech uh, <clears throat> we or a technology company we actually you know go through a scoring method uh, depending on the vintage depending on you know a, a whole host of things a whole host of things <clears throat> now having said that you know uh, that is the regulatory uh, path that we have to take and you know we have dedicated teams who only focus on that on the business side of things what we do is you know uh, <clears throat> like any other fintech you know we also run our own pnls and uh, depending on whether it's a liability business whether it's a asset business whether it's a payment business for a particular product or something we decide on what kind of a fintech we want to partner whether we want to partner from a distribution angle whether we want to partner from a technology angle whether we want to partner from a you know ui ux simplicity angle and so on and then once that partnership is sealed and then basis that you know uh, we decide how to go in the market if you talk about zubin especially uh, equitas small finance bank then we have uh, you know gone ahead with a 50 50 approach so uh, 50% of the business we do a direct go to market and 50% we do with a partner led model or a fintech led model <clears throat> so if you look at you know uh, uh, our casa digital casa okay so we were one of the first banks to uh, launch the digital only savings account in the country and if you go to our website you can do a selfie account we call it an a selfie account you can do a selfie sa you can do a selfie fixed deposit directly from the website same thing we have launched neo x along with you know neo so it is the fastest and largest neo bank in the country today so that's a partner led model <clears throat> similarly if you look on the fixed deposit you know you can go to you can book a selfie fixed deposit fd from my website but you can do the same thing from google pay you go to google pay search for equitas and you get a equitas spot and you book a fixed deposit same is the case with prepaid same is the case with micro atm same with the case with you know upi so on and so forth 
So one is the regulatory part of it. Second is the business part of it. So, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Vibha. I think you made an interesting point. I think on the models you talked about, you know, co-branding, BC type, and technology, and I read them as one is a fintech saying that you know you take care of regulations and you you have a license, so therefore you do that, and I'll do some of the market facing stuff, and that's the co-branding. And the BC is where you talked about access, right? Last mile, I think that's an area where you see some fintechs playing. And the, of course, the other is technology and new age tech, which you could potentially look to look to you know work with. And I think you made a very interesting point on the regulations, and I see that. a lot of fintechs do say it's difficult to work with banks but i think as you said you know it's it's a lot of requirements put down by the regulators and you all need to ensure that you comply and make those checks and i think that's why that's why sometimes we see that friction and it takes some time then people would like to move but i i, I totally get your perspective of you know having to follow and having to do those checks and balances and prove to a more prudent regulator on top of you to ensure that you know you comply with everything so interesting interesting points made by you uh thanks for that uh uh gurujit pal coming over to you now i mean underbanked unbanked population segments uh, i think world bank and a lot of reports have said one eight of the individuals also the msme gap right i mean it's a big gap uh, i think uh, suel you mentioned something about you know 500 or trillion in terms of the lending on this segment so there's a big gap on you know financial inclusion or being able to give access to funds for a large set of you know people and some of it is to do with not having documents or not having a history and not having all of that so i uh, just wanted to hear from you and given that you you'll work in this segment of getting businesses right and sme and msme segments so what is the role that fintechs can play to kind of really grow this in india from an fi perspective any learnings that you had with uh, you know what you may have done in uk that you can bring here or any new things that you've learned to doing in india to be able to really get get to this segment quickly and fast So this is uh, actually very interesting, uh, uh, but you know, overall, if you look, uh, the role of fintechs in financial inclusion, I think that is very well accepted uh, in the ecosystem, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the regulator, the government has encouraged it. Even I would say the uh, the banks, the NBFCs, uh, and uh, you know, players like NP, uh, NPCI, all of them have created a conducive environment where. Uh, fintechs come in and uh, uh, you know by virtue of being uh, led by technology and by virtue of the reach right they they would of obviously be playing a very important role in uh, financial inclusion as such uh, but when we come specifically to the sme segment right uh, uh, you know uh, there is a very important role to be played in digitization and then you know in making the uh, these these micro and small enterprises organized uh right india has 10% smes uh, globally right 64 million out of this uh, you know close to 35 million are unorganized and there is a huge flow uh, you know to move from unorganized to organized so with both these right uh, if you digitize them uh, uh, you know uh, in a seamless efficient fashion if you help them get organized say uh, you know register themselves do taxations invoicing all those pieces uh in a proper compliant way you essentially uh, uh, you know have taken the first steps of uh, you know uh, helping them get the kind of financial and digital footprint that they have right uh, you need to uh, bring a, a digital account to them all payments payouts etc right so how do you do this well this is this is very important but you know more so uh, the 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 second order uh, thing which Uh, most of us intend to solve for is how do you bring the credit pragmatically to uh, you know this this enterprise right so now here is is uh, uh, you know a uh, important aspect which is uh, you need to bring in financial awareness here right you need to help them understand uh, you know uh, uh, the nuances of revenue margins cash flow in a subtle manner and bring the first set of lines which will enable them to become a credit worthy uh, you know enterprise uh, you should not be giving them credit in a way which sets up uh, you know sets them up for failure right the horrendous rates at which uh, you know these people get their first credit line uh, is essentially setting them up up for failure so that's that's a challenge and 
uh, you know, with all the footprint, uh, uh, you know, the challenge I'm underlining is how do you use this footprint pragmatically and how do you bring these lines to them that, you know, they grow into a, um, uh, you know, they grow into a business which is financially savvy and pragmatic. Now, if you abstract out, right, what is a credit score or what is, a, a, you know, a formula in with, with which somebody decides to lend, you know, ability to pay and willingness to pay, right? Now, how do you model both of these? So, uh, you know, you could uh, uh, abstract out the ability to uh, pay through various digital footprint and financial footprint. But, you know, financial awareness becomes very important in the second aspect, willingness to pay, right? And how do you, you underwrite? And, you know, uh, remember, who are you competing with here? You are competing with the unorganized world. The unorganized money lender also has a framework with which you know he lends now how do you underwrite in a pragmatic fashion bring a product to this uh, uh, you know user which is also uh, you know competitive in terms of uh, the rate at which it 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 comes to that enterprise so if you look at the basket of micro and small enterprises right uh, you need to have models where you pragmatically underwrite and you figure out the better ones out of it and bring credit to them uh, in a responsible way at at the at the cost which which would enable them to to remain responsible you know this is something which which has happened in the developed markets right if you uh, read about the journey which uh, 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 you know which bunch of uh, uh, you know digital lending platforms had in the in the us i think that's very important case study and you know that's something which uh, we as a market will evolve, uh, you know, over over next few years. Uh, but that part is is very important. I think the focus should be, uh, you know, to uh, to of course help them digitize and organize, get them digital footprint, and you know help them organize. But along with that, use this data pragmatically, underwrite and bring responsible credit to them, so that over time they become a. Uh, uh, you know, they, you do not set them up for financial failure. Give them credit, which sets them up to build a, uh, you know, a good credit history as uh, you know their their journey grows. So, partnering in this journey, I think that is the key and important problem to to solve for. Thanks, thanks, Kurojit Pal. I think uh, interesting points about not just lending and giving off money at some uh, exorbitant rates, but really. You know, responsible lending is what you really touched upon. And I think it's a very important type, especially when dealing with a segment that's new to finance, right? And we're saying inclusion because they're not part of it. And there's a little bit of training, grooming, learning that needs to be given so that you set them up for success. And I think that's a very important part. And I think uh, fintechs do a, do a lot of that to get in these new players or first time, you know, first time, first time MSME customers. So I think the good points made. So Rashmi, now coming over to you, given that, you know, you all operate, uh, we're in India, operate in various geographies and national company, uh, you know, helping the, uh, you know, financial innovation and, you know, what would, what would benefit the situation of financial access in the cross-border payments, you know, what have fintechs done differently to disrupt this area and what are those benefits to the end customer, right? Because this is a space that, I think it's becoming, becoming more and more relevant. The world is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, there are more needs, as you know, uh, Suel said that you know we do a lot more transfers over borders that we did uh, than we did, did did yesterday. And there are old models and there are new models, right? So I mean, just want to understand more about this space and what Wise does and how is it different from the rest and what are the different other models, if any, that are emerging in this space. Sure. Thanks, Zubin. Um so you're right, right? Cross-border payments is now becoming uh, much more relevant. Uh, customers are transacting, businesses are transacting globally. Um, and hence, there's an increased need for a new model in cross-border payments, right? So what do I mean by that? Traditionally, if you've seen cross-border payments have been very clunky. Um, they have been, you know, they take forever for the intended beneficiary to receive funds. And the third and the biggest bit is that there is no transparent pricing, right? The customer or a business is actually paying a lot of hidden fees, markups, etc., and have no idea what they're paying for. Um, this has been the traditional model. Uh, when WISE started about a decade ago, I think these were the three pillars that we wanted to optimize. The problem statement was, why isn't it as simple 
to send money across borders as it is sending an email today, right? And how can we make it better? So in the last decade or so, we have actually invested in our own network um, in infrastructure in having our licenses across the globe that ensures that as much as possible, money does not actually move across borders. Wise is doing payments which are faster, instant cross-border payments, cheaper to the customer as well, because we are very transparent about what the customer is going to pay. And uh, the third thing is we're also ensuring that the customer journey is not cumbersome. It's convenient for anyone to come in and sign uh, up on the platform and, and digitally transact on the platform, right? Now, I would say that fintech such as Wise, and Wise is just one of the players in this market, but fintechs such as Wise have kind of acted as force multipliers, right, in this segment. Because more and more now, I think, regulators across the world are you know, opening up their eyes to say that, yes, cross-border payments need to become much more simpler. They need to become much more transparent. So I think the European Union about a couple of years ago um, passed this transparency, uh, you know, that uh, cross-border transfers have to be transparent in pricing. So firms which are helping customers um, pay globally have to be very transparent about what they are charging the customer. So I think this dialogue has come about only because there were newer models that were coming in the market, right? Um, the second thing I think, and which has been a very recent announcement, is the pay now and UPI linkage. That is important because, again, that goes to having instant payments even across the globe, right? So while we've seen domestic markets, digital payments have gone, you know, because of NPCI, because of the regulator, they've gone through the roof. I think the same model is going to play out in cross-border payments as well, right? Um, so I think, all in all, uh, fintechs have been able to kind of change a little, yeah, and there's a long way to go, of course, but, you know, the presence of fintechs such as WISE have helped make cross-border payments much more seamless, much more cost-effective, much more transparent, uh, much more convenient for the end customer, and that continued investment, right, will ensure that that trend is followed, um, along with, of course, a lot of conversations and engagement with the regulators to ensure that the infrastructure also builds up. Thanks, thanks, Shashmi. I think you did mention about prompt pay UPI. I think that's an excellent. It'd be interesting to see how that pans out. I mean, it'll be imagine as simple as doing a UPI to someone in the country you're doing to someone overseas. If it's really made as simple as UPI is today domestically, it would really be a wow. I think uh, let's see how that pans out. Uh, great, uh, Weber. I kind of bring you back, bring you back on. Uh, and this is more again regulate. You know the RBI has advocated. You know co origination. You talked about in the loan loan model, right? Banks and NBFCs entering into partnerships with fintechs and all of that uh, to be able to address that. You know credit bag credit gap and also risk sharing. You know kind of percentages or things have been laid out laid out there. So just wanted to understand what's your take on how do you see you know such an initiative by by the central authority and uh, what will be the impact to the end customer on such a model? being you know promoted by the regulator that work with work with you know nbfcs and fintechs out there and see how you can you know address the segment sure Rubin. so let us understand you know uh, what is this uh, uh, co-origination or code lending model so rbi i think came out with these guidelines sometime in 2020 and november 2020 and uh, basically it allows co-lending scheme for banks and nbfcs the model is to include the flow of credit to underserved, you know, unserved segments of the society and to make funds available at an affordable cost. Now, generally, when what happens is, see, banks have lower rates, uh, okay, and NBFCs have, uh, uh, you know, higher rates, but at the same time, NBFCs have a better reach. Now, the co-lending model has been brought in to make sure that the borrower gets the best of both. Okay, so where the borrower is able to, uh, uh, you know, have a better reach because of the NBFC and have advantage on the, you know, uh, rates from the bank's perspective. In most partnerships, banks keep 80% of the loan on their books, NBFC keep the remaining 20% on their book. Uh, if you look at some examples, Yes Bank partnered with Karun Vesha Bank, Bank of Maharashtra partnered with Loan Tap, you know, uh, so on. Uh, largely from an engagement perspective, they need to have a master agreement in place, you know, before they start the co-lending. Uh, NBFC has to be the one point of uh, contact, uh, you know, all the uh, disclosures have been to be there in the agreement. Uh, it has to be told to the customer upfront and so on, you know, and finally it has to be an all-inclusive rate. Uh, uh, 
there is a focus on grievance redressal the grievance redressal typically should happen within 30 days that's a key thing uh, on the co lending piece uh, you know escrow framework account framework has been defined for the transaction routing uh, there has to be a plan for business continuity and so on uh, if you really want to measure the success of you know the co lending framework and see where it is going and what industry is looking at it then zubin i think you know uh, uh, the series a fundraising of cred revenue is a testament to that okay we have all seen it is probably possibly one of the large, you know biggest uh, series a uh, in the country that has happened uh, 90 million re- recently last week i think and you know cred revenue actually focuses on this so if if you go through their uh, you know uh, uh, <clears throat> the product that they provide it is focusing on coal ending and that is where this particular thing is going today and specifically you know let me uh, uh, pull a couple of points from what gurjot uh, was mentioning earlier there are certain segments of the society where you know we need to understand where if there is an intent to pay back okay you have to understand what kind of a customer is borrowing from you what kind of a financial profiling you are creating okay uh, taking a couple of snippets from what Su- suhel was saying earlier you know do you have any alternate data basis which you are going to you know create this so that is where you know such kind of frameworks come in very very uh, you know helpful because use of alternate data <clears throat> along with a you know a robust technology like a ai and then clubbing it into a financial profiling engine and then bringing in multiple lenders on the platform okay that becomes a very very beautiful product and then you club a distribution at the front end which is a combination of digital and digital then sky is the limit zubin okay it's it's just for somebody to set put together a product put together partners and roll it out and that is what is happening in the indian context today if you look at in the next 4 years 22 23 24 25 you know this field is definitely going to boom this field is poised to grow at at tremendous rates it's a very sure thanks thanks i bought uh so gurujit pal over to you now and i think there was a, there's a question i see in the chat from rahul which says that can you help me understand msme sme still see tax rates tax filing aspects as one of the factors making digital adoption sluggish at their end cost for becoming digital first is added on to the cost of sme retail so is this uh, what would be your response to this uh see it's it's a challenge right and uh, mm, uh the challenge for a micro enterprises it's typically a one person show right and uh, uh you know to do the banking compliance and taxation well today you need to uh, you know go to different platforms you also need to uh, you know because it's different platforms right you also engage with professionals and, and and you know all those related uh, ways of doing uh, these things in india and you know essentially that adds to cost one and other important aspect is it also uh, you know sucks out of time uh, you know from uh, this micro enterprise and essentially uh, uh, you know he could actually use that time to to do uh, his business well right uh now uh, you know the way we try to solve this in uk and the way we intend to solve this in 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 india is that how do you bring these things to a single platform uh which makes uh, you know your banking which helps your banking talk to your invoicing your invoicing talk to your taxation uh, you know and all this uh, comes to the micro enterprise at uh, you know one platform and we save him money and we save him time which essentially then he can use in doing whatever he's best at right he he's best at running his shop he's uh, uh, you know best at uh, running his mic uh, manufacturing unit he should spend time there one second you take out the inefficiency of uh, you know professionals because that is expensive and when you look at a micro enterprise it's it's difficult uh, you know to take out that money Uh, you know to pay and hence uh, you know uh, this this becomes a entry barrier for them to move um, uh, you know from an organized to organized segment or do uh, things in a compliant way this one second also bring those benefits back to them you know what are the benefits that i have as a business if i do things in a compliant way if i do my taxation in a compliant way so on and so forth right so how do we enable Uh, micro and small enterprises on that segment right uh, 
uh, that's that's also uh, an important aspect and you know i think that can also be used to to uh, you know further remove this this barrier so this is the role which fintechs uh, like us are trying to uh, to play and make it easier for a micro enterprise uh, to do business in a in a compliant manner thanks kanju it paul so i think it's making them understand the value of becoming a lot more organized and compliant and then i think it's it's not about they see it as a cost but actually there is a lot more benefit if they once they start understanding to become compliant uh, so i'll come with you with the last question and then we'll wrap up with you know key takeaways from each of you uh, so also uh, i mean in this you know table stakes demanding you know digital world of you know making things a lot more digital we see different models we see banks uh, reinventing themselves having digital only offerings we were the kitas also having a completely different pnl that focuses on a very much you know first digital first kind of ecosystem of course fintechs partnering with licensed banks or whatever and the neo banking space we have some of them here and also then there are you know payment banks that exist which of course can do a lot of work on the payment side but of course not so much on the you know the lending lending side of things so there are these players that are competing in this space so how do you see this panning out do you believe that uh, each one has their own segments and they're working fine or do you believe there's some change that should bring it out to kind of level the playing field for everyone um so to be honest i think um, uh, i at least feel very happy with the way things are uh, they will keep on evolving on their own um, i think uh, you don't want to kill sort of experimentation and sort of uh, what the government is sort of uh, or rbi is sort of doing right so i think uh, uh you can always argue that some of these have been more successful some less uh like i personally and my uh, my sort of opinion is probably worth nothing i believe like payment banks is a big failure what's the point of a bank which can't even lend right so uh but uh, but uh, but that sort of uh, when you have five successes uh, you are sort of bound to have a couple of failures along the way i think then that's part and parcel of the journey um i think to me a lot of this will start converging towards uh, uh we sort of instead of worrying about taking each other's share are actually looking at uh, building the whole pie right so uh, there are still 65% of india is still new to credit right so uh, we are not um, it's not like we've matured the market and like everyone is um, uh, a credit seeker and everyone is running five loans at any point of time right so uh, like we talk about credit card data a lot there are 6 crore credit card 3 and a half crore credit card users right so um, so i think each segment of the market today has a potential of becoming 20x or what it is uh, so therefore it is less about uh, competition it is more about continuing to innovate and seeing how we can get a lot more people into banking get a lot more people into using credit in the right way and a lot more people to start using other financial services products everything from insurance to cross border payments etc etc and if that sort of has to work uh, then npci rbi regulators uh, banks whether neo banks or fintechs they have to sort of all uh, um, work on this together right so there will be some products which a bank will always be better at doing and there will be some products which a fintech will always be better at doing and there will be some which will probably be better if we start collaborating together right so like especially on like stuff like gold loan and all of that you see what rupee does um, with a lot of banks on the gold loan side it's transformative at one level right so um, i couldn't ever understand why a gold loan is at 20% 24% cost of capital you're taking my gold and giving me 70% of loan against it and then charging me 24% for that right so um, i might as well sell that gold and like uh, buy it after like 12 months again right so so i think and that's where sort of the fintechs and the banking system exists ex, uh, sort of historical banking system come together and create sort of win win product right so i think uh, to me this is less competition this is sort of a lot more opportunity to collaborate and sort of collectively expand the pie a lot more than what it is today thanks thanks so also i think it's a big it's a big uh, you know space out there everyone can create its niche is what i'm hearing and you know each one has their varied roles to play and i suppose it's it's not a competitive space but i think it's each one finding their right spot or sweet spot to work in the ecosystem is what i hear mm-hmm. okay so given i think uh, we have just about 5 minutes left uh, i want the last question to each of you 
we know digital, we know each of y'all come from different, you know, different areas, whether it's banking, offline payments, cross-border payments, all of that, right? So if y'all were to give advice and y'all have all kind of inward kind of leaders in each of those segments, if y'all were to kind of give advice to, you know, other, other fintechs or startups or, you know, your likes out there in terms of what is it that they should do or what is the kind of thing that they should do next or the right step that they should take in this, in their, in their respective spaces, just one advice or one or two areas of advice that you could give to your, you know, your peers or areas who are entering a space that you're in working now. Uh, let's start with maybe Rashmi from your side. Um, hey, Zobin, that's a, that's a very loaded question, actually, but <laughs> I'll try and answer it as best as I can. Um, I think uh, we have been speaking about these uh, so-called uh, trends or, or uh, you know, the principles under which we think success is going to happen post-pandemic. Um, and one of them, I think a key trend that I hear is collaboration amongst different ecosystem partners, um, whether it's banks working with fintechs, because banks, like I think Suhail said it very well, banks will do some things well, fintechs will do something well. So how do we kind of marry that? So I think collaboration is going to be a key theme, so to speak, uh, going forward. The other big theme, um, I think, is also going to be regulatory engagement, right? How do we ensure that as an ecosystem, we also work with the regulators to ensure that digital modes, um, whether it's in payments, whether it's other financial state uh, you know, systems or services, become much more efficient because, of course, models are going to change. So how do we work with the regulators to ensure security for the end customers, to ensure transparent pricing, to ensure you know, a better customer journey? I think... Those are two, three pointers that I would probably mention. Thanks, thanks, Rashmi. So I think important points. Uh, collaboration is is the way forward, and I think uh, given it's you know FS is a little bit of a regulated space, you need to either get the regulator to come up to speed or work within the ambit of the regulator. And I think engagement and that constant engagement are good points to make. Uh, Suel, over to you next in terms of your side advice that you would to give people in your space? Uh, I think uh, one advice is probably is true for every industry is uh, think consumer out, right? What does your consumer really need? Uh, and what are you therefore offering, which is disruptive and hopefully expanding the pie? I think uh, this is not necessarily true only for fintech. This I could have said in the consumer forum or any other forum, but, uh, but I think it's sort of the core of what you are building and why people will consume it, right? So um, I think that's sort of one. I think the second thing, which is more fintech uh, oriented and Rashmi did touch about it is this is a business of trust, right? You're handling people's money. Um, you're handling people's money. So people will be jittery. Uh, RBI will be jittery and everyone else will be jittery and for the right reasons, right? I, I'm not saying that uh, there is too much regulation in this space. I think how do you build your sort of company in a way that, it is sort of seamless on consumer experience, education, and sort of handling of money, uh, I think is very, very important because one bad event on this, uh, like it takes a lot of time to build trust and uh, it just takes like two instances of failures to actually lose the consumer forever, right? So I think uh, over-index on sort of scalable products, over-index on sort of building tech, ahead of the curve versus sort of leaving it too late and leading to sort of a, a drop in consumer experience or uh, meeting the regulatory requirements. Thanks. Thanks, Will. I think the point in trust was important. I think we're almost at the end. Uh, uh, Gurujit Pal, over to you for a minute and then maybe Vaibhav for the last closing comments. So uh, just to add to what Rashmi uh, Sohail mentioned, uh, you know, my two cents uh, would be if you're solving a problem in FinTech, be it for any category. Uh, please do not assume that the existing players, uh, you know, a bank, a NBFC or a, or a scheme, uh, you know, the question, why have they not solved the problem till now? Uh, you know, that becomes very important. It's, uh, uh, you know, I would say it's very close to foolishness saying that these people are too big or lazy, uh, you know, to solve a particular problem. Uh, you need to look deeper into into the networks. You need to look deeper into the business to look for the problem that you're solving for. And in that manner, right, 
uh, I believe a number of fintechs are solving problems not only for their DG, but also for the ecosystem as such. There are a lot of ways in which fintechs are bringing value back to banks. And, you know, banks and ecosystem appreciates that. So I think, you know, getting your, um, uh, you know, uh, problem statement right and uh, figuring out the inefficiency that you're looking to solve for and the value that you bring to the end customer as well as the ecosystem. I think those are, uh, you know, some very important and difficult questions which uh, which people in fintech need to uh, need to answer to, to in order to create positive value. Yeah, bye, Bob. Over to you, Lars. <clears throat> sure, Zubin. So let us understand that the consumer, when it looks at a bank, it looks at a bank from a trust angle. And when it looks at a fintech, it looks at a fintech from a convenience angle. Uh, I see it at, uh, as, you know, uh, there are two types of fintechs. So one is who is into the market uh, distributing the products. So they create their own tech, they create their own business model, their own product team, and they distribute. And then second is, you know, uh, the aggregator fintechs who actually aggregate who create their own product, but they don't distribute. And then there is a, you know, so there are largely these two types of fintechs which have been working in the Indian space. Okay. Uh, from what the regular, what I expect is the regulator may come up with some kind of an engagement framework between banks and fintech. And I was mentioning this on another panel yesterday. And <clears throat> that kind of a framework is important because once that kind of a framework comes in, it will, uh, you know, pave the way for the new fintechs who are entering into the space to understand, uh, A, what is the problem that I want to solve and how do I want to solve it? by collaborating with a bank okay because banks are traditionally regulatory very compliance heavy uh, you know institutions and some of those risks once they start getting transferred to this fintech to this framework then that would be the actual reality check for this new fintechs who are coming in and that is when you know they would decide whether i want to get into this or not that's my two thanks thanks Viva. i think it's not just two cents good good wise wisdom for everyone entering space um, I think we're out of time and I think I enjoyed myself and thank you everyone for all your contributions. Really had a great chat. Uh, until next time, catch you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rubin. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you, Rashmi, everyone for sharing their inputs. With, with that, it brings us to the close of this session. It was quite an enriching one, I must say. Uh, with that, I would like to thank our partners, Razorpay, Amazon Pay, WhatsApp, in association with Google Pay, open financial technologies and cash free payments for supporting us for this event. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day.